In this lecture, we're going to talk about the singular value decomposition. So if you recall, a square matrix A is diagonalizable if we can write it in the form P, D, P inverse for some invertible matrix P and some diagonal matrix D. But as we've seen, not all square matrices are diagonalizable. However, we also saw that all symmetric matrices are not only diagonalizable, but orthogonally diagonalizable. And we're going to use that fact to prove the decomposition that we call the singular value decomposition. So here's what that looks like. It turns out that for any matrix A, and it doesn't even have to be a square matrix, any m by n matrix A can be written in the form q times d times p inverse. So it's not quite as strong as diagonalizability because we have a different matrix here q than this matrix p. And as we'll see, the matrix here d is not quite a diagonal matrix, but it's similar to a diagonal matrix as we'll see when we get into the details. But the key idea that's going to make this work is what we talked about, where not only are symmetric matrices orthogonally diagonalizable, but no matter what matrix A we have, the matrix A transpose A is symmetric. Because when we take A transpose A and take its transpose, we're going to use the fact that when we take the transpose of a product of two matrices, we can apply the transpose individually to the two matrices as long as we reverse the order of the multiplication. So we get A transpose, and then A transpose, transpose. But the A, that's A transpose A, which is the same as what we started with. So this is how we're going to be able to make this work no matter what matrix A we're starting with. So we're going to use a lot of the ideas that we talked about in the previous uh, few lectures. So since A transpose A is a symmetric matrix, there's several things that we can do with that matrix. We know that symmetric matrices are orthogonally diagonalizable, and so that means that we can find an orthonormal basis for the entire vector space Rn that consists of eigenvectors of that matrix A transpose A. And we're going to let lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on be the corresponding eigenvalues. So first let's notice that if we take the norm squared of the matrix, the original matrix A times the vector Vi, remember that that's really just A Vi dotted with a vi, dotting a vector with itself is the norm squared. And we have this alternative way to write dot product that we use a lot, which is that we take the transpose of the first vector and multiply it by the second vector, which gives us a one by one matrix that we think of as a scalar. Now we're going to use the fact that when we take the transpose of a product, it's the product of the transposes in the reverse order. And notice that in the middle here, we have a transpose a. So a transpose a times vi since vi is an eigenvector of a transpose a, that's just going to be lambda i vi. Lambda i is a scalar, which means we can move it out front. And then vi transpose vi, that's just vi dotted with itself. So this is vi dot vi. And since it's an orthonormal basis, vi is a unit vector. So vi dotted with itself is just 1, and so we get lambda i. So the norm of a vi squared is the eigenvalue lambda i. And one consequence of that is the eigenvalues of A transpose A are all non-negative because they're something squared, so they might be zero, but they're definitely not negative. And so notationally here, what we're going to do is we're going to write the eigenvalues in decreasing order. We're going to renumber these so that lambda 1 is the biggest eigenvalue, lambda 2 is the next biggest, and so on, all the way down to lambda n, which is the smallest, which is greater than or equal to zero. Now, several of the lambdas might equal zero. That's, that can happen, and we'll talk about that. Um, but we're just going to write them in that decreasing order. And so the singular values, remember we call this the singular value decomposition, so what the heck is a singular value? The singular values are what we get by taking the square root of each lambda i. And remember, that's just going to be the norm of a vi, because lambda i was the norm of a vi squared. So if we take the square root, that's just the length of the vector a vi. So we're going to call those sigma i. So that's a lowercase Greek letter sigma. Sigma sub i is defined to be the singular values. So before we can get into the singular value decomposition, we're going to prove this theorem. So again, we got the same setup that we've been talking about. Suppose that we have an orthonormal basis for Rn consisting of eigenvectors of A transpose A, and we arrange them so that the eigenvalues are written in decreasing order, lambda 1 through lambda n. And we suppose that A has R non-zero singular values. So like I said, some of these sigmas might be zero because the corresponding lambda might be zero. So however many of the lambdas aren't zero, we're going to give that number a name, we're going to call it R. And so what this theorem says is that if we take 
AV1, AV2, up through AVR, that's an orthogonal basis for the column space of A. Notice that the other AVIs, so for example, if I were to look at AVR plus 1, that vector is going to be the zero vector. Because remember, the length of AVR plus 1 squared, that's lambda R plus 1. And I'm assuming that all of the lambdas, and correspondingly the sigmas, that come after this number R are all zero. And the only vector that has a zero length is the zero vector. So really all I'm doing is I'm looking at the set of all of the vectors, a times vi, and just throwing away the ones that turn out to be zero. All right, now to show that the set of the avi's is a basis for the column space of a, we have several things that we have to show. We have to show that the avi's span column space of a, we have to show that they're linearly independent, and then because the theorem also says that this is an orthogonal set, we'll have to show that as well. So we'll start with the orthogonality. So what we need to show is that anytime we take two vectors out of this set and dot them together, we get a zero. So we're going to look at avi dotted with avj, which again we're going to write in the transpose form. And this is a similar calculation to what we did before. We get vi transpose lambda j vj, and because the vi's and the vj's, those are orthogonal to each other, that dot product is also going to be zero. And remember that what we just said before is that avi is the zero vector if and only if the subscript is greater than r. And so that means that this is an orthogonal set of non-zero vectors. And another thing that we've proved earlier is that if you ever have an orthogonal set of non-zero vectors, it's automatically linearly independent. So all we have to show is that this set of vectors spans all of the column space of A. So how do we show that these vectors span the column space of A? Well, we choose an arbitrary element of the column space of A and try to show that that element can be written as a linear combination of the vectors in that set. So what is this arbitrary vector y being in the column space of A? What does that tell us? Well, the column space of A is all of the vectors that look like A times x for some vector x in Rn. But we already have a basis for Rn. That basis that we started with was the v's, v1 through vn. And so that means that x can be written as a linear combination of the v's. So what do we do then? Well, y is ax, so that's a times that linear combination. And we know that a times vi is 0 if the i is bigger than r. And so all of the a times v that go beyond the subscript r, those are all the 0 vector. And so this really is a linear combination of the avi's. And so that means that the avi's span the column space of a. Okay, so now we're ready to start talking about the singular value decomposition. If you remember, I mentioned that we're going to have a matrix in the middle of the decomposition that isn't quite a diagonal matrix. And this is what that matrix will look like. So it's going to be a rectangular matrix, the same size as the matrix A. And it's going to be mostly zeros, just like a diagonal matrix would be. And it, the entries on the diagonal are sigma 1 through sigma r. And every other entry of the matrix is going to be zero. So even if it's a rectangular matrix, the entries are going to go down that main diagonal. The 1, 1 entry is going to be sigma 1, the 2, 2 entry is going to be sigma 2, the 3, 3 entry is going to be sigma 3, and so on, all the way up through the R, R entry will be sigma R, and then everywhere else in the matrix will be zeros. So here's what the singular value decomposition theorem says. Again, we just say that we have an m by n matrix that happens to have R non-zero singular values. Well, then there exists an m by n matrix sigma, just like what we just saw in the previous slide. And there also exists an m by m, a square orthogonal matrix u, and an n by n, square orthogonal matrix v, such that a equals u sigma v transpose. And remember that since these are orthogonal matrices, v transpose is the same as v inverse. So the way that we're going to prove this is by figuring out how to construct the matrices u and v. We already know what sigma looks like, and then we just have to show that a really does equal u sigma v transpose. So we're going to start just like we did in the previous theorem. We're going to get lambda i and v i be the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for a transpose a, so that when we put the a v i through a v r, what we get is an orthogonal basis for the column space of a. And now we're going to normalize each a v i, remember divided by its length, to create an, a unit vector, and that's going to give us an orthonormal basis u1 through ur, an orthonormal basis for the column space of A. Now what are we really doing when we take avi and divide it by its length? 
Remember, the length of AVI, that's what we were calling sigma i. So ui is 1 over sigma i times avi. And if I multiply both sides of that equation by sigma i, I get this relationship where avi equals sigma i ui. That's going to be an important thing that will come up a little bit later. Now typically some of the singular values will be 0. So typically r will be less than m. And what we're going to want to do is extend the set of u's to be a basis for all of Rm. So if u1 through ur, if that's not enough vectors to span all of Rm, we want to throw some more vectors in there to fill out and create a basis for all of Rm. And one way we could do that, there's not just one way to do this, but one way we could do that is to think of the matrix capital B, which has the u's as its columns. And one of the things that we mentioned when we talked about orthogonality and orthogonal projections is that the orthogonal complement of the column space of B, remember that's what that little symbol means, the orthogonal complement of the column space of B is in fact the null space of B transpose. And so one of the ways that we could figure out how to add more vectors to this basis to maintain the orthogonality and the orthonormality is to just find an orthonormal basis for the null space of B transpose, which would involve solving the matrix equation B transpose x equals zero. That would give us a basis for the null space of B transpose, and then we could use Gram-Schmidt to transform that into an orthonormal basis. So that would be a fairly tedious process, but we could definitely do it. So we're going to assume that that's done. And now we have u1 through um, which is a full orthonormal basis for all of rm, where the first r of those are the vectors that we had before. So now we've got the v vectors, which were the eigenvectors for the matrix A transpose A, and then now we've got these new u vectors that we've just defined. So the matrix capital U is going to be the matrix whose columns are the u's, go figure, and then the capital V is going to be the matrix whose columns are the V's. And so we've defined these two matrices, and we know that these two matrices are orthogonal matrices. The columns of the U's is an orthonormal set, an orthonormal basis for Rm, and the columns of capital V are the little V vectors, and we also know that those are an orthonormal basis for Rn. So now all we have to show is that A equals U sigma V transpose, and we're going to do that by proving that AV equals u sigma. Because if we take that equation and multiply both sides by v inverse, which remember is the same as v transpose, that's exactly what we get, is a equals u sigma v inverse. Okay, so what's a times v? Well, that's the same as taking a and multiplying it by each column of v. And remember, the columns of capital V are the vectors, the little v's. What we also know is that whenever we multiply a by any v vector that's beyond r, that those all work out to be zero. And so the r plus one through n columns of this product matrix are all the zero vector. And we also talked about how when you take a and multiply it by a vi, that's the same as taking the corresponding singular value and multiplying it by the corresponding u vector. So that's one way that we could write the, the matrix a, v. All right, now what about u sigma? Well, the u matrix has the u vectors as its columns. And the sigma matrix is that not quite diagonal matrix that we talked about. And when you work this out, this is the same as taking the sigmas and multiplying them by the columns of the matrix U. Except for these columns here, since those all have zeros in them, we're going to get zero vectors in those corresponding columns of the product U sigma. But notice this is exactly what we got when we wrote AV on the previous slide, and so this finishes the proof of the singular value decomposition theorem. Okay, so how would we actually go about finding the singular value decomposition of a matrix? Here are the steps that we would do. The first thing we need are the vectors little v. We need to find an orthogonal diagonalization of A transpose A, with all that entails. So we need to find the characteristic polynomial, we need to find the eigenvalues, we need to find the corresponding eigenvectors, we need to use Gram-Schmidt to orthogonalize that set. So there's a lot going on with step number one here. It's just a few words, but, but there's quite a bit going on there. But once we find those v vectors, then that lets us set up the matrix capital V. We know how to set up sigma because the little sigma values on the not quite diagonal of that matrix, those are just the square roots of the eigenvalues. So once we have done step number one, step number two is pretty easy. And then the u vectors, remember the u vectors were just the normalized versions of A times VI. So this is just AVI divided by the length of AVI. So really most of the work that needs to get done is done in step number one here. 
But that step number one involves lots of different steps, lots of work going on there. So in practice, it's pretty tedious to do for any matrix of any reasonable size, and so we're going to want to use technology here. The command in Mathematica is simply singular value decomposition with a capital S, a capital V, and a capital D. So in this case, we're trying to find the singular value decomposition of the matrix with rows 1, negative 1, negative 2, 2, and 2, negative 2. And so here's how we need to interpret this answer. So this is actually a list of three matrices. The first matrix is this matrix right here. That's going to be the U matrix. So in this case, that's the matrix negative 1 third, negative 2 over radical 5, 2 over 3 radical 5, 2 thirds 0, square root of 5 over 3, negative 2 thirds 1 over radical 5, and 4 over 3 radical 5. So that's the matrix U. The second matrix in this list is the matrix sigma. So notice that it's mostly zeros. In fact, it only has one non-zero entry, 3 radical 2, in the 1, 1 position. What this is telling us is that the matrix A transpose A only had one non-zero singular value. Everything else in the matrix ended up being zero. And then the third matrix here, that's going to be the matrix V. So in this case, that's a 2 by 2 matrix. And remember, this matrix has its columns being the orthogonalized eigenvectors for the original matrix A transpose A. So negative 1 over radical 2, 1 over radical 2, 1 over radical 2. 1 over radical 2. And then what should be true here is that the original matrix A is u times sigma times v transpose. So what is this all good for? We talked when we learned about diagonalization about how diagonalizing matrix allows us to take powers and products of that matrix with itself in a much simpler way than actually working out the matrix products. Obviously, if our original matrix A is not square, then that's not going to be an application for the singular value decomposition. But what we're going to see is that one of the big applications here is that we can use the SVD to approximate a large matrix A by only looking at the largest few singular values. And one of the applications of that is to image compression and image processing. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture.